in other programs on television, on you know Channel Nine and Channel Ten. So I think what this group then did, they decided to create their own um, their own kind of group, their own organisation where they could film, they could do dance, they could do and. Everyone represented in this film were from different backgrounds and I think that's a really positive thing. We tried to empower the VMC by giving you know, funds for, for events. We try to empower young people as well as you know, other older people to, to try and convince and show the Australian society that we aren't all Anglo and white. I'm not Anglo and white, I'm from an Italian background. Um, but we, and it, as I said before, it takes time, but hopefully, you know, in 10 years time, we won't even be talking about, 20 years time maybe, we won't be talking about marginalised people, especially women. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm Martin. Um, I'm questioning what I'm doing here at some level. Uh, I suppose the work that I've been doing in the past is about facilitating people who have identified as being marginalised to be represented on screen. And I suppose there's echoes of what you've done, Dan, as well. Um, and I, uh, I think maybe that, that's been something that's been quite interesting. Um, I initially started out as a creator, as a filmmaker, and I had a production company and we made lots of stuff and um, we built a business and we made more things and we uh, got television series and it was it was relatively, it wasn't easy, it was a hard grub, but there was, um, there was this kind of access that we just had and it was um, an extraordinary privilege which I didn't really uh, reflect on, I just kind of accepted, but there reached a point where it became pretty obvious that the reason that I was able to just continue making things and to continue generating money and uh, just, I just looked right and sounded right according to the people who I was working with who all kind of like talking and sounded like me and I felt like that might be a little bit uh, unfair. So the, 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 I, I, I gave that company away and I gave all the money that I made at that time away. And I started with an organisation that was called the Media Resource Centre, which is the equivalent here called uh, Open Channel. Uh, and I've been working with uh, a couple of filmmakers in South Australia, uh, one of whom is a magnificent man of Dutch origin called Rolf de Heer, um, who was a mentor who had been working with a lot of indigenous communities and he made a film called uh, the Tracker, and he was working on another film called Ten Canoes. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's uh, both beautiful films. Um, and uh, you should see. Uh, and, and he was very much a guide and a focus in terms of like, oh, how do you start to become like a, an active listener and transform that into a creative act for yourself? So, you know, like as an individual maker of stuff, I can feed my ego but I can become a facilitator and an active listener with others and to facilitate stories from the margins, whatever those margins might be, I, I enter into a variety of different screens. We have this extraordinary kind of uh, explosion of, of screen culture that was happening in that time in, in the mid-2000s. And all of these new opportunities were opening up for new voices to be heard in new ways. And that was incredibly inspiring and exciting to be a a part of that, to, to start hearing new voices and to start seeing new modes of expressions and new characters on screens that I hadn't come across before. It was like a, it was it was both a, uh, an, a period of kind of extraordinary education and, and a total privilege to be a part of that. And then I, I ended up moving overseas to start working with um, uh, organisations in Cambodia and Sri Lanka various other places and, and there was this incredible hunger with these groups that I was working with overseas to, to make stories and to share those stories with their own communities and with others and just the act of making those stories built a sense of community identity amongst the people who were making those things together and it was transformative watching those young people make stuff 
they became leaders and advocates for themselves, and it was uh, an, an incredible experience. We've all been thrown into darkness. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was, that's, that's been my kind of little journey, and um, I'll pass it to Vikram. Quite an interesting discussion around a whole lot of aspects. I'll just reflect on a kind of project that has been pending for almost since I've come to Australia, and this, is, this project came to my mind. And uh, it's a documentary which I've been wanting to do, and still want to do, uh, rather, still doing it in some way. It's, uh, ti it's, the title is In the Crossroads of Casteism and Racism. So the idea was about right from my first uh, documentary as a student which I made doing my masters in filmmaking. And it was a documentary called Yatharth in Hindi. And, uh, that literal translation is uh, the fact. And one of the sequences uh, where we were interviewing, so we were interviewing about the caste discrimination that exists in India and the kind of marginalization process that it brings or it entails. So the first person we talked about his caste prejudices and we wanted them to be very, very truthful about what they want to say. And then he, he started off saying that, you know, why should I eat or do things with people who are like my shoes? I cannot take off my shoes and put them on my head. They have to be somewhere outside. So they, they are fit to be in my feet. And that made me really angry. That made me mad. And that's how my own journey of, of, of filmmaker, of trying to explore these issues of caste discrimination, firstly in India. And when I came to Australia, there was another kind of thing which I started seeing was, there was never, never, of course, there was never no direct kind of racism, you know, unless, you know, you meet a drunkard sometimes in Domino's or some McDonald's on a, a weekend and then they would come and try and imitate your Indian accent and then try to say something like that, which has happened a whole lot of times to me. But uh, I already know that. But for me, most important was what am I watching on screen, on television, on in cinema. So like when I watch Bollywood films, oh wow, I, I'm a Bollywood scholar. I write about Bollywood and I love talking about Bollywood in the most positive sense. But when I watch Bollywood, it is all about upper caste. It is all about Kapoor's, it's all about, you know, uh, high caste people out there. It's all about glamorous life. It's all about people who are jet setting. It's all about people. So the story of the common man, the story of, man, uh, of people who are working really hard and they, in their day-to-day life, their stories are missing from the Bollywood song and dance escapist cinema. Though, I'm, again, I'm a firm defender of those escapist cinema, I love it. But somehow, those marginalized people's voices are not there. It was somewhere in the parallel cinema, but in commercial cinema of India, it's missing. And then I look back, I come to Australia, and there is a big growing, you know, Australian Indian film industry. Now, how many of you know about this Australian Indian film industry? I bet no one knows here, except for those who are working in there. All right, but then they are doing their best, but the problem is they don't know about and the fundings, they don't know about who to approach, what are the dis uh, distribution platforms, or even actors who wants to make to the mainstream, what is the process of going through or getting a chance in the mainstream media. So there is a difference between tokenism and actual participation. So, so of course, Australian media does its best in terms of tokenism. So does the Indian media is, does its best in terms of tokenism of the caste representation. That too, government funded projects. So same way in here, maybe ABC, maybe SBS, they will do their part. So th that, that's the question I keep asking. And, but of course, as, some, as one of the part there, you know, as someone has mentioned that, of course, the future is going to be much better and all we, have, we all have to work towards that. But how can we make the present much more stronger so that we can say, yes, the future is better? That is my question to all of us. Are we doing enough or maybe as Media Institute, are we pushing those kind of stories out there to the students to think about, to interact with those kind of outsiders or marginalized people to come and give them a platform in universities to talk to the students? mingle with them, you know, there are a whole lot of things around that. So probably this is a question for all of us to think and maybe plan on that. So, back to Preeti.
That was very good. That was really insightful. And just to hear the diverse views and backgrounds of each one of you, it, it's really enlightening. Um, I particularly liked um, some of the points that you know, uh, Mar Michael, Martin, Martin. Mar sorry, Martin made and Vikrant made as well, uh, and the the promising young director that we have here, <laughs> Victor, you may. Um, I want to draw in on the theme of the representation of that we call marginalized in the cinema aesthetics of cinema. Um, are we, by presenting the marginalized in the way they are seen on the screen, are we creating further stratification in the society? Is that, what are the thoughts? So if someone, for example, belongs to a caste, particular caste in India, Vikram, then if we present them exactly the way they are on the screen, are we just reinforcing, they are getting present, presented on screen, but how is that transforming the public consciousness is well, my question. And, and if it applies to yeah. everyone else who are from different backgrounds, yeah. please have a thing and present your views. Can I add on to that? Again, the caste representation, again, that's a problem because caste in India is a stereotypical notion. So anybody who says that, oh, he like caste is used as an abuse in India. So if you are from a down, if, a, if you are a backward, from backward caste or a so-called untouchable caste, so anyone from upper caste will instantly think, oh, he's from an, a kind of a untouchable, so-called untouchable, it's banned, uh, like the, it's not anymore considered that, but still people. So they will think that they have to be dark skinned, they have to be lean thin, they won't be getting enough food to eat, they should be wearing something which is of not good standard, they should be like that. So in film, they can't be heroes. There is no story about them to be heroes, so they have to be in that caste. Okay? So that's the problem. Okay. So caste also you know, makes you into a particular thing. And that's what is problematic. You know, Satyajit Ray, the of course celebrated filmmaker, he was celebrated worldwide for his representation of the Indian society, the way he saw it. And, but whereas he never got that kind of uh, success in India, because, of, because people were so used to Bollywoodization of things that they glossed over and they thought maybe this is just boring. Parallel cinema or reality, cinema based on reality was a problem. And again, the stereotyping of people from different backgrounds, it's a big problem. So today, like in Australia, like in Hollywood also, it's still difficult for an Asian to become the main actor. Okay? They have to paint them to look Asians, to be there. That's another problem. Maybe I'll pass on to someone. Anyone else has views? Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I actually, my whole film's actually, my, my whole body of work actually thematically tackles that actually. Um, because there's a very particular type of story that's told in the West about I guess, you, in my case, uh, Asia, the Filipino um, <coughs> culture and thematic. Um, and for me, I purposely write as if I was to separate myself from what everyone wants and what everyone wants to see, and I just literally tell it as is. And that's only subjective because of my, like, it's subjective to my point of view. Because I grew up in a lower class family. I grew up with an abusive, oh, anyway, I won't go into too much detail, but I grew up around a lot of things and I portrayed exactly as is. So um, for me, um, and you know, and then obviously like once you get older, you get into uni and you realize that, you know, you know look, look the part, wear a suit. But I'm still, <laughs> it's funny because digital filmmaking has allowed me to actually uh, make films about what I went through on a low budget because it's intimate, it's with my family, it's, you know, I, I used to love my real family actually. Uh, I opened my, my recent feature with, uh, to the family members, uh, to the members of my family who, who are not named. Because <laughs> I'm literally just, you know, writing fictional versions of what, what's happened. So for me, um, that, that, that's something that I find interesting, it's almost autobiographical whilst also being fictional. And for me, that's how I find my purity and honesty in represent representing. Because I'm not writing it for anyone other than 
or you know, I, I guarantee there's a lot of kids from my you know, um, you know, uh, backgrounds like myself that would watch something that I make and, and burst into tears because they're like, this is how I felt growing up. That's important to me, and that's all I want to show. So that's my point of view. So, I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> don't you? Um, for me, uh, I think an additional thing for me is also the language of cinema itself. That uh, you know, there is a mainstream cinema that has a way of telling stories that uh, is not what I'm kind of interested in. And I think there's also a way, there's also a need to learn to tell stories in a different way, in uh, maybe a more fragmented way, in a way that sort of talks about the, the disenfranchisement or whatever it is that uh, where those things come from in, in the first place. Because in the end, if I think essentially, if we have got this kind of, there's a sort of an empowered language in terms of this whole class thing that the whole, you know, the way the stories get told within the mainstream kind of reinforces that no matter what it is about. And so I think we also kind of have to look at the way, you know, and the materials we use and where we screen those films, you know, in what places they get screened. Perhaps they don't. They shouldn't be screened in the cinema, they should be screened in kind of those places where, you know, uh, I agree. I think as much as art or cinema reflects society and what's happening, there has to be a way to show how it should be or bring that marginalized to the center rather than actually showing what exactly the way, the way society is actually treating them. Because I think that's how you will attempt at even changing public consciousness around it. Um, anyway, I'm going to open the the panel to the floor. Any questions, any burning questions, please raise your hands and we'll bring the mic to you. Can I, can I, ask, yes. can I ask a question? Yes. Is it, can the panel and we ask questions? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, you can. Not for you guys, the panel. Um, I, I was kind of curious, um, maybe this is a question that bridges most folks here, um, you originally were talking about trying to find some kind of um, expression that is not a traditional mode of expression on screen to reflect marginal identities uh, or to represent marginalised or different identities on screen. Um, so I'm curious, does, do, can you have like a traditional uh, film, classic kind of hero's journey, uh, populated with traditionally marginalised groups and actually have an authentic representation of the marginalised on screen? Or does it have to be inherently experimental? That's kind of directed at me, I think, all those possibilities there. Okay. Sure. Or I'll, I'll move it along. As, a, as I'm saying, that, I mean, that you know, all those possibilities are there. I would not want to be so didactic in any of those, that to, to exclude those possibilities. Is your question uh, where to show uh, movies? Where to move forward? Not how. Uh, or, or can you have a traditional representation? folks on screen and that be an authentic uh, representation of marginalised voices as well. Oh, I think Maybe it's got to be organic. <laughs> well, I, I was actually on a, I was asked to be on a film which I actually left, <laughs> but uh, I was asked to be on a film uh, last month and um, the movie maker actually was compartmentalising everything and he said, now I need to have an Aboriginal now I need to have um, an Asian. Now I need to, oh good David, you're Jewish. I'll just tick that one off. And um, oh, it was bloody horrible. It's got to be done. Now everyone that was there was fantastic. I got along with them, I made a lot of friends. I just thought that the filmmaker was the biggest dipshit I've ever met. Um, you can't compartmentalize, you can't force. It does have to be organic. Now. What really got brought up here that I felt was important was the stories. You see, in the indie movie industry, no one's going to say no to somebody on the basis of race or religion. The story's there. It's like, come along, and whoever's best for the job gets it. 
I mean, quite frankly, if there aren't enough women directors there at the moment, and most of the directors I've actually worked with are women, but when I look at it in the indie movie industry, most of the directors there aren't. It's just which sets I got on to. If, the, if most of them aren't women, it's because there weren't that many women that were interested compared to men, because most of the makeup women artists have been women. There weren't that many. What we have to do is have an organic thing where more women want to be directors, more people of different ethnic backgrounds want to write stories, and it'll happen over time. But if we force it, we're just going to get something stiff and nasty. There's a, there's a, sorry, I just make a quick comment. Uh, Freddie, when you made your introduction, you were talking about the ideal of cinema that will lift up you know, communities who feel, people who feel marginalised, and also stories that will do no harm to people who feel like that. And it's a really tricky space as a writer, as a creator, because if you work too much on your sleeve, you know, it, it smells bad. If you, um, you know, and there are stories where sometimes perhaps drama or the ideas of dramaturgy or drama can work against you know, not causing harm to particular communities. So it's a really, I, I mean, I think it's a whole new skill set for writers and creators really to be able to do that effectively. I think uh, what Martin has point, uh, pointed out about this traditional way of storytelling and putting marginalized stories in there, uh, I can think of a very interesting example from a 1930s film from India, and it was titled Achhut Kanya, which was the untouchable girl. So it was in the 1930s when a story of a marginalized community was taken into mainstream cinema and using the then reigning superstar Devika Rani. And of course Devika Rani have an interesting story to that and she has Australian connections as well. So anyway, uh, that's an aside. But uh, the interesting thing was that was the super hit film of that era. But what has happened over the time that uh, people start making assumptions and especially film producers that something once it gets a commercial success they try to repeat it again and again and again and some stories suddenly they feel that these are working and that is not working and that is the problem and this is on the basis of my discussions with over the years with various Bollywood film producers and directors as to asking them the questions as to why the marginalized people are not being represented in that manner and somehow they see that that stereotyping of them was not giving them enough space on screen has created that understanding that oh that won't work commercially that can only be supported by government funding so if the government funding is there it means that even if you make loss it's not your money which is going in a loss so that commercial thing which goes so much into consideration of making mainstream films that these kind of traditional narrative or, 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 uh, which is there and which can easily accommodate marginalized and stories of marginalized, which we see. It's not that it is totally not there, it is there. But people still feel, and then because it's such a disorganized thing, especially in India, because that's where I follow more, that they don't want to touch that, those kind of subjects and all, because they are always in the risk of losing, losing money, not about making a good story. So there is a big difference about making a good story and giving representation to the people, which people want, but they don't. We lose money. That's another aspect. I'm just throwing that aspect. Maybe you agree or not. I think we had a couple of queries. Thanks, Pat. Good evening, everybody. So, um, my name is Seed and I am, I can't call myself a budding filmmaker, but I just try to, you know, get some acts together to put that together. What was interesting is the fact that when I was listening to all of you, I was thinking, yes, we are looking to, you know, get uh, a different aspect or a different perspective towards not only filmmaking, but also film showing sometimes, because a lot of people are unsung heroes making those films, watching themselves going to bed, feeling good about it, and that's where it starts and finishes off and fades away like in your case as well, you get no audience from here, 